to meet you. My name is Edgar Ortiz. I'm Director of Solution Architecture for our East, U.S. East and Federal business at, at No Name Security. I have the good fortunes of having seen No Name grow from employee number 32 when I joined to now a company with this amazing partnership with IBM and Intel and other organizations. Prior to No Name, I used to help customers build out their API programs. So in some ways, you can blame me for the, the issue we have to secure today. Uh, besides when I'm not working at No Name, I have some special interests, of course. I studied computer science, spent many years as a software developer. And when I'm not on my computer, I'm playing my guitar, listening to music, probably at a concert. So a lot of 80s heavy metal. So if you ask a question today, please, you know, speak loudly because <laughs> there's, like, there's heavy metal or hair metal. <laughs> Uh, Metallica, <laughs> Anthrax, Slayer, Little Jewish Priest in there, of course. Okay. Norwegians. Iron Maiden. Anybody going to Power Trip in October? <laughs> no? Okay. Um, so I won't have as many slides today. Uh, I'm hoping this is an engaging conversation with you all today. So I'll dig in very quickly. Um, Philip introduced the pillars of API security. My focus will be on the first three, discovery, posture, and runtime. And I'm going to get straight into the platform. The first area I'm going to dig into is discovery and posture management. And you already started a really riveting conversation around this and the importance of discovering these, import these assets that you have in there. Uh, our point of view is simply that you can't secure that which you don't know is out there. I just tweeted that. Amazing. Get out of my tweet. <laughs> get out of my head. <laughs> so when you get into the platform, that's the first thing that stands out, of course, is, is asking that it's 10 o'clock, do you know where your kids are question? How many APIs do you have? Uh, along with that, of course, is, in my view, what makes an API a critical asset to an organization is the nature of the data which it exposes. That's what ultimately provides functionality to an application is the data. You think about the Starbucks application, I see lots of Starbucks on the tables here, so I'm gonna use that analogy. When you're retrieving your account information through your mobile app, when you're paying for, 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 your, for your order. When you're down the street identifying which location you want to order from, that is all an API call. And that's an interchange of sensitive and critical data at times. Are those data type tags, are those ones that are defined by your system? So it knows what PII should look like based on a certain definition that I feed it or something that you've been like slowly assembling? All of the above. And we'll get into that here really quickly. Uh, when we think about our inventory, we are we are we're we're building an inventory based on not just the data, of course, which is important. And as you asked, yes, the data does come from a preset of data types that we've defined out of the box. But it, of course, we understand that every organization is going to have their own type of data that they're sensitive to. Our our definitions may not match their definitions. So every organization that, that leverages our product has the opportunity to create their own custom data types that matches the business that, that they operate in. We have some common ones in there like API keys, PII data, first name, last name, email, social security number. Uh, to get into a more specific use case, this answer is an important question for us, is if, if I'm at an organization that wants to answer the question, show me all the APIs that have a, a name in them, right? Very quickly from that inventory, I could sort the data and narrow down my view into what assets I have that have that sensitive information in them. Before you go too much further, what are you feeding? What's input to this inventory um, process? Yes. You know, um, are you feeding it the, the, the uh, swagger definition? What do you actually feed it? Okay, that's, that's actually a good dovetail to, to how do we get data to the system. Happy to answer that. So let's, if we look at the... I, I don't mean to take you off your feet. No, but it's, it's perfectly fine. I'd prefer for this to be an engaging conversation than me just plowing through a standard demo. So when you think about the hypothetical API enterprise stack, you have, of course, the user, the client, there's a WAF, there's a web application, there's an API gateway, and then there's the services or possibly Kubernetes, some sort of stack that's built on. This presents an opportunity for our solution, lots of places to integrate. So first, you have the public cloud providers like AWS. They provide functionality like traffic mirroring that lets us get at the network level and capture packets and analyze the network traffic for API activity. The web app application firewalls like Cloudflare, Akamai, and others, they have, they have a framework that allows you to extend their WAF and capture traffic as it's going through their web application firewalls and send it to no name for analysis. 
So we're capturing traffic at these different places on the network, sending it to no name for analysis. May I ask a little more about that? Go ahead. When? When is it? Is it um, post uh, TLS decryption or pre? Post. So typically, uh, I'll go, uh, the other example is API gateways. So all these, all these spots on the network typically have some point where they decrypt the message to understand how to route the message, where to send it. And within these frameworks, in the application context, we're able to capture the traffic in the clear. From there, we're able to copy the message and send it, re-encrypt it, then send it to no name for analysis from there. Okay. Uh, I was going to talk about load balancers and API gateways as well. F5 is very common in an enterprise. Um, that they also present an opportunity to tra capture traffic off of them. They have their ILX rules, I rules, easy plug-in to install an F5 and route traffic to us. They also have the ability to do clone pools. Clone pools is basically network mirroring, capturing traffic uh, packets going through their, the appliances. Same idea. API gateways. Quite possibly what really drove a lot of the adoption of an API-first model at enterprises. You have MuleSoft, uh, of course, Kong, Apigee, IBM, great partner of ours, Akana, and others, they provide a means for full API lifecycle management. So very common in the enterprise where you see a digital experience being built, whether it's, it's a Starbucks, a bank, whatever it may be, they likely have an API gateway where we can integrate and we can help them. They might have a substantial inventory of their APIs already within that gateway or within that API platform, but we'll allow them to go further and monitor that traffic for anomaly detection. And all of these gateways offer a very consistent framework that simply lets us put a plug-in on the gateways, capture traffic, and in the same motion, send it to no name for analysis. Yeah, you're going to talk more about those plugins, or yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll right. dig in. I'll, I'll dig into the the metadata. So going back to the example within the platform of what do we capture? So part of the the slide that I showed was about discovery and posture management. Underst discovery and po the posture is understanding how is that API configured. For example, is that API internet facing? Why is that an important question to ask? I might deploy an API or a service that's meant to be internal only. And we've done evaluations with customers where we find even in a non-production environment where APIs that were intended to be internal only are configured to be external. That in and of itself can cause an incident and requires actions from security operations to remediate immediately. Other, other elements of importance here is the authentication on the API. Is that API, if I have this stack of a WAF, a load balancer, an API gateway, am I leveraging that gateway to apply proper authentication policies to that API? Has, that de has the developer fulfilled that contract to implement a proper uh, authorization on that API? Another piece of posture is the infrastructure that that API relates to. That API is going to be deployed on some sort of virtual machine, a VM, a container. So more and more what we're starting to get into is, is identifying what does the network look like and building a graph around, around that. For example, here, this API from the graph is deployed on an EC2 instance. And visually here, I can see that there's a load balancer in front of it. I can also see that there's two routes to it, to the public internet. Um, I would look at this and say, well, why, are there, why is there a route not only directly to that API, yeah. but also through the load balancer? That seems like a misconfiguration to me. That should only be routed through the load balancer. And where's my gateway here? I think that that's, it's, so visually here I can see at least that, that, that there might be some potential issues in and the configuration. It's on, um, it's on um, SSH. The one that doesn't go through the. Yes. So this is a this is an SSH port open to the internet. Good eye. There you go. Maybe that's okay. This is Steve. Yeah, um, Steve, go ahead. When, when you're looking at this diagram here, are you getting this completely from the data you're ingesting, or are you doing additional work via external scans or some other things to to see that these things are exposed in the public or is this purely in the 
the captured data that's sent over. So let's say with the AWS example here, there's an opportunity with AWS, given the Bezos mandate that Philip talked about, everything within AWS is an API. There's, there's an SDK that allows us to retrieve the configurations with, of that AWS account. So from that, we can see all the assets, including the, the EC2 instance, we can see the network routing rules, and all that to help further enrich what we're monitoring via traffic analysis. And we can, in addition to the traffic analysis, we can look at the configuration of the environment itself. Excuse me. Let's see. Thank you. Okay. So, so what are the other sources that you're able to ingest to, you know, to to firm up the the actual traffic data? So, one, the configuration. So, through those SDKs, we can retrieve the configuration of the actual AWS account itself. For example, how's the v, what are the VPC routing rules? What is the EC2 instances security policies? How is that API gateway configured? We can retrieve that all via the API. I hope I'm answering your question. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm trying to get a sense for how much data you have availability to and where you're ah, able to, to. So how much? Source. What are the sources? It's dependent on, on, on the customer and the organization. By and large, we try to do a read only on those types of things. We don't try to. We we do have opportunities for changing rules, but we have a set AIM uh, AWS policy that we provide our customers that gives us access to a lot of information with respect to to the network stack in that environment. And if it's a mixed environment where you know some of it's on prem and some of it's AWS, you're able to ingest logs from both sides and and correlate them for for a particular application. How far down this path do you go? For our on premises customers with still data centers, it really is specific to what appliances they might have. For example, with our F5 integration, we do have the ability to pull configuration from F5. We have that capability there. I hate to say use the phrase it depends. But given the complexity of on-premises deployments, I'm, I'm going to say it, it's up to the config of the, the, what technologies that organization has on-premises. For example, Kubernetes as a platform, if the organization has that deployed, there's again another opportunity to pull configuration from that platform and, and enrich our dashboards as well. How long is so I could assume that you know the major load balancer uh, and other front ends that are available commercially. You know you're going to support ingesting from them. Um, you know, but maybe not the the small names in those spaces. Yeah, I think by and large, like F5 is like everywhere, and that's the biggest of the bigs. Um, of course, Nginx as an open source load balancer, we're able to pull configuration from. This this slide here is not comprehensive. Of the integrations we support, but this is probably the most common ones that we encounter. How long does it take to onboard, given the potential integration points across your load balancer, your API gateways, you know, other elements in there? I've seen customers onboarded within 30 days, so it's a really quick time to value. I'll give you an example with the MuleSoft integration. That's something that could be applied very broadly to, to their gateway ecosystem in, in minutes because that platform has already provided the facilities to, to, to just apply the policy to multiple gateways. Other, other platforms, like, again, Kubernetes, using as an example, you have Helm charts that yep. allow you to automate the deployment of that. F5, maybe on the other side, perhaps not as much an opportunity to automate. So what I would recommend to organizations in certain instances is identify where your most critical applications might be and start there. And then you can incrementally expand your visibility as, as you go. And does the tool have anything built into it to help you with that in terms of like, maybe we install this on nine pieces of infrastructure, but we really needed it to be on 11. Does no names detection or, or uh, discovery say, hey, we think you missed the step? Uh, yeah, with, uh, so I think that's where the discovery and inventory comes in. You, you had a question, sir, I'm sorry, what was your name? Alex. Alex had a question earlier about, can we import API specs? And that's your, your kind of your, if you have specs for an API, that's your known set of APIs typically. So we do have that capability. Um, so I would, I would say you can, you can contrast, say you import your specs, this is your set of known data. And then as you start ingesting traffic, you can start to see, well, I don't, for some reason, I don't have visibility into these sets 
of APIs. Why is that? And in the platform out of the box, there's a column here, API spec, and it's telling you whether or not there's been a match on that traffic or not. So you can do that comparison and say, for some reason, I've not gotten visibility into this spec, that sh this API that, sh that should be known. So, so that really- it will say, I found something that's not on your ingested list. So that's the other side. going. That's where I was going. <laughs> okay, so when you're thinking about how we integrate, it's really about identifying a choke point in the network. This is where integrating at the network level, it is a lot of data. However, that's gonna cast the widest net in your network to do identification of APIs. For example, there's certain technologies, I'm gonna call out Gigamon, is a network aggreg aggregation technology. You can funnel all your traffic to it and it could spit out unencrypted ta traffic to various other solutions like ours that ingest packet data. At that opportunity, you're, you're seeing everything on the network. And that's your probably your best opportunity to see widely, maybe at the load balancers as well, because that's where you're going to see a lot of traffic. Um, and th those, those end up being the best opportunity to cast the widest net on a network and identify APIs that are, un that are really unknown. And just ask, in your experience working with your uh, customers and clients, how often do you discover something like this? Because, I mean, it's a major fail. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it is a mega fail to have a publicly exposed API that no one, no one apparently knows about. Probably at least. You know, I mean, I, I, I'm, my scenario is you show up, you say, give us the, you know, give us the high level input. Yeah. I, know whether, I don't know, you haven't answered yet, what you take from a developer, you know, what, what you suck out of the repo. Mm -hmm. But whatever you ingest directly should match don't you think? Yes, it should. Everything that that app um, is accessing. There's a term so, for it. I mean, I'd it, really yeah. be interested in how often that happens, if it, there's a mismatch. It's, it's the reason I came to this company, I'll be honest. Uh, I, I think I joked earlier that I was part of helping a lot of organizations build out their API programs. And I remember when I was part of an API company previously, a customer came to me and said, we realized that they learned through an audit that a rewards API they had published was being abused to give someone like free coffee and other rewards uh, on their account. And they asked me as the solution engineer on, on that, on that, for that organization as well, what can, what can that solution do for you, do for us to, to identify APIs that aren't in that situation? I said, well, let's dig into it. And what I came to find out that that API that was abused wasn't even the standard rewards API. It was an API that was built as part of an internal hackathon that had access to a database. And from there, so, so an adversary found, found that endpoint and abused it to, to, let, to go give themselves free coffee and rewards, which is wild to me in the first place. And so I said, look, unfortunately in this case, because that API was not registered to the gateway, my, that solution at the time that I supported could not provide any, any visibility into that API. And at the time, that was my light bulb moment, actually. You know, these yeah. no-name guys are on to something. Maybe I, I'm going to go take that call. And, and unfortunately, we've seen those misconfigurations at times when we are at the network level. We've seen, we've seen APIs more common than I, than I wish we had to admit. Absolutely. Well, how Very interesting. Does someone write some code, they're doing testing and all. Yeah. They leave and no one else knows about it yeah. for their own internal testing. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the network's very messy, right? You would think that from all your ingress points, from your Akamai to your WAF to your API gateway slash load balancer, along those points, that those would be the normal place to instrument. Yes. Normally, right? You would think that. Yeah. Because once you get in the network and do packet capture, it's very messy. It's hard to parse. It's, it's, it's a mess. But as you're pointing out, those typical places you would expect to have that API inspection all the way from the outside to the inside miss all these weird situations where there's a hole in the firewall, 443 has an alternate way in, and it still gets to the application cluster somewhere in your network regardless. Yep. The only way is actually look at all the traffic into all your application servers everywhere. Yes. Um, that seems like a lot of inspection. Is there a time when you, the customers say, you know what, I've got enough now, let's stop and just focus on the app layer and get the the, the packet capture because it's just, it's it must consume a lot of resources to keep inspecting, re-inspecting, you're not finding anything new at some point. Yeah, those appliances that do the, the network capture broadly, 
they're there, especially I've seen them a lot at the financial institutions because of the nature of, of the regulatory scrutiny that they go under, yep. they have to break and inspect traffic yeah, to understand. Yeah, blue box. It's right? just a big old blue box. And I'll say the same for all of our federal agencies. Mm -hmm. they're, they're definitely monitoring traffic going through everywhere, and, and so that presents an opportunity. We're not the only solutions in yeah, there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean yeah. for Gigamon, you know, it's a network packet broker, right? It's designed yes. to take that you know, and, and, and distribute the yeah. traffic, but a lot of those do the metadata and the headers or just headers in. In your case, you probably inspect a little deeper than that. Yeah, we ask for both the header and body of the message. That's correct, and those are those can be pretty large when fully assembled. I presume. With API calls, we're lucky. They're they're in more in the megabytes range. Then we're not going to get a. We're not getting. We're not doing binary files. We're not doing not images. Getting YouTube video. Exactly. This stream is not going to going to probably go through our solution. But the API call to retrieve the stream. Right. The yes. Yeah. How. Um, active is this inspection like you're you're looking at um uh for api endpoints and when you're um analyzing captured traffic i consider that passive inspection if you're ingesting swagger documentation how deep inside the api are you going are you um you know reading the swagger documentation and executing transactions all the way through the api to see what's involved or is it mostly passive once the endpoint's discovered so what I'm showing you here is passive. What Tomer in about 40, 20 minutes is gonna show you is the active part where we flip this. Rather than passively monitoring the traffic, Tomer will show you where we, we go earlier on in the dev cycle and drive traffic to an API. I'm not gonna spoil the chalk track, but in, in, for this part of the platform, yes, we're passively monitoring traffic. And then um, once you've done all this, I assume at the end of the day, you're either generating a report, um, alerts, or integrating with some kind of event response system to say, you know, hey, dummy, take a look at this. You know, what is the, the response side um, look like? So let's get into, we've talked about, so we've talked about discovery, just to close off that, we've talked about discovery and posture management, inventory of APIs, ability to search, filter your API inventory, and all the key integrations that we have to various platforms. With that question, I'll shift now into the runtime protection piece, where this is where we're passively monitoring traffic, and we're doing two things. One word, yes, as we're taking each, each uh, transaction in, we're building a model using machine learning around, to understand how is a user consuming that API. And then from that model, we can detect deviations and potentially anomalous and bad behavior on the network, right? So I'll dig into that now. So yes, the outcome of, of what we're doing in monitoring traffic is the detection of issues ultimately. And these, these issues can come in various flavors. Uh, I'm gonna start with, with um, we talked about some of the posture issues, but I'm actually gonna go even earlier in the discussion and talk about recon, because there was a question about this earlier, I think, uh, about doing reconnaissance. Our recon issues all we need is a domain name for the organization. Pick uh, the domain name for, for, for this event, you'll input it into the platform, and we can passively scan and look for potential breadcrumbs that an organization might, be, might have left out there that could lead to an API incident. For example, a Swagger spec uh, on a Postman, or a Postman collection that's available to the internet with no authentication. This can be easily found. Uh, a GitHub repository that maybe is still not properly secured. I heard about a question about S3 buckets yeah. earlier. There's that could, that's still an issue. Yep. You know, even it has now um, gone to the top of the list of data breaches after SQL injection has been there for decades. Yeah. So they finally did worse at securing data on the internet than SQL injection. Yeah. Even though now I notice it really nags you when you configure an S3 bucket. It tells you, are you sure you want to allow public access? Yeah. I'm like, well, yes. They finally changed the default. Yeah. And so did Azure as well. Yes. They finally said, you have to like work hard to make it public right. access. Yeah. You can't even do it at deployment. You have to deploy it and then open it up. So I can't resist though. Move it is a SQL injection. <laughs> right. They're all yeah. Yeah. Um, they, they never go away. Yeah. Those things never. Go. I'm going to give a plug to one of the architects on my team who wrote an amazing blog about the Move It issue. 
and how it's API related. We actually found that's not sidetracking. No, <laughs> that, that no. Sidetracking. Okay, but that's uh, that is you're absolutely right. We found that we were, that with the API calls. So when you look at Move It as a solution, this is an example of the third party yeah. API issue. Yep. That's a solution of a third party that you've deployed in your premises and has APIs in it to, to manipulate it and, yep. and, and its operations. There is a, there's a, it has its own Swagger spec. And so we found one organization had this spec publicly facing. And so from an external source, we could, you could call those APIs and manipulate the platform for them. So um, I, I don't have the blog at the ready, unfortunately. Maybe I'll share that uh, on Twitter later. Shout out to all the Twitter folks out there. I'd be interested in reading it. Yeah, uh, Darren Presbitero, he, he's, uh, he's our, the solution architect on my team focus uh, entirely on federal agents, uh, on our federal practice. So um, yeah, he, he just published that this week. So it's funny you mentioned that. Um, I digress. Recon, as I said, is the breadcrumbs. Before I attack any, before an adversary attacks an organization, they're gonna, they're gonna scope out and see where where are there potential things that you've left public that could aid in constructing an attack on an organization. And I and I gave very exam various examples, including internal documentation that's been left leaking or is leaked to the public. And that gives me a hint or an attacker a hint of how they're gonna attack an organization. So that's a precursor. We can do that entirely passively with just a domain name. We discussed posture issues. This is a result of just doing inventory. How is that API configured? Is an API with sensitive information and without authentication internet-facing? Internet now, that's, that's an incident that you want to know about. Why? Because, one, there's sensitive and critical data involved. So that ele elevates the severity of the issue. It's internet-facing. And there's no authentication. So these are all questions that I answered just by inventorying the, the API itself. Another example here, uh, that's the same one. Uh, technical information leaked in the headers, that's still, that's still there. If I know what type of server you're running, I go look up the relevant CVs for that server and that gives me another hint to try to, how to attack you. That's posture. Now, I mentioned- Sorry, I misunderstood. Yes. Are you evaluating headers dynamically? Uh, in your recon function, is that what you were? So I, I was a little confused. So I, I separated the so there was the recon and then there's the posture issues. The posture issues we are looking at at the at the metadata or the transaction, and we're looking at the header information of the, the API transaction. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Now I'll move on to uh, to runtime issues. The runtime is where we're as I mentioned building a model around the user behavior and identifying how is that API being used. So let's say in one evaluation that I ran with a customer, we actually saw that in over the course of the POC, there, there was one incident where an API went from five requests per second to 10,000 requests per second. Okay, pretty, so you, a pretty stark increase in the number of transactions on that API. And when I presented this to the CISO, he mentioned, so that's what happened. And I said, elaborate, what do you mean? He's like, well, on our other tooling, we were seeing all these events happening, but we weren't sure what was going on. And here it was in the incident described as an excessive data exposure, where we described exactly how many requests were sent, what was the data that was being transacted, and we were able to show them not just that something happened, but what happened uh, over the course of that, that attack that we noticed. And they were able to remediate that very quickly. Uh, and so this is where, where we can potentially, see, we, where the platform can see, here's the actual transaction. Now, typically, we don't store, we don't store every transaction right now. That's we're not quite in the business of having to store, do a big data lake to to store every transaction. We might someday, but for for the purposes of analyzing the transaction, we don't need to store each one. We just need to analyze it in memory, contribute it to the model, and move on. When we detect an incident, though, we can say it's useful for the purposes of investigating an actual issue for the security practitioner. They need to see what the transaction actually was. So in the case of an incident, we do store what we saw here. And this says excessive data 
exposure on an authenticated API. And if you look at the description, it says the API returns more data than necessary, um, which the definition of which is usually an API, if you think about a login API, it should be a login API. It shouldn't also do your payments transactions. So as the platform learns, it can say, hey, this data doesn't seem to be germane to the purpose of this API itself. And from an API first strategy standpoint, that also helps operations teams is look, this, maybe this API is too big. It's serving too many masters in this case. Uh, maybe you need to break it down, this functionality, so you're not exposing too much data through one endpoint. And we can understand this by monitoring the traffic. What and seeds the model uh, as to the function? The, the name. How do you know it's a payment versus a. Uh, a, a are we talking, when you said learn, are we talking machine learning, a bunch of if statements, pattern matching? Just expand on All of the above. All of the above. Okay. Do we get to drop the AI word? word? I didn't drop the AI word. I know you did. So I'm asking. That, so I, AI word? I used ML. So <laughs> is it that, could... that formal that it's doing it? Um, I'm just giving her a hard time. Yeah, I mean, we leverage unsupervised on mm -hmm. online machine learning to okay. build yeah. those models based on statistics that we yeah. see. Yeah. Um, it, it's all good, and I appreciate you didn't drop the word because usually... I'm trying, to be, I'm trying not to be that guy. Yeah. <laughs> usually when we hear that word, it, sometimes when we hear that word, it really just means, you know, we have some ifs. I've seen the meme. I'll bump my yeah. doctor, that's what it means. Yeah. yeah. Oh, good. Yeah, I think what's super important is that when we focus on application APIs, they're all different, right? So every company Absolutely. creates its own specific API. So that means we can't label any data. We don't know what's coming yeah. in. We don't know what anything looks like. So the only way to tackle it, which is sort of a, a superhuman problem because it's so much call, so much yeah. traffic, is to run it through this. Absolutely. Model. And so since we're talking about this, because I had this question back when we were talking about the data type tags, is that also using machine learning or something to look at the names? Like, how are you saying it's PII? You said based on the names, the like first name. And then if it's not any type of machine learning or smart, let's just call it smart stuff, then how many languages does it support? Are you assuming that most APIs are written in English or the top five languages? How does that work? If you know the transactions themselves are it's probably primarily english it's probably yeah. 95 percent of that yeah. uh we're starting to do work and we do a work in apac so that we're going to have to support different different languages of course which is kind of another reason to go into a machine learning thing because yeah. then you don't have to keep building these patterns of words absolutely yeah okay thanks quick time check i have a i think yeah. three minutes yeah your yeah. quick question that's pretty relevant to runtime here are you guys doing enforcement or is this, I get this and here are things, here's my homework I need to go deal with to fix all these problems. No, sir. Thank you for that question because I might've forgotten if I hadn't said that, uh, if you hadn't asked that. Beyond just taking in data, we have various integrations into the ecosystem as well. How do we inform the SOC that there was an incident? Because they're, they're more than likely, as much as I'd love for them to spend the entire time of their, their workday in the platform, they're very likely have multiple tools. So from a security operations standpoint, they're going to be funneling data into their SIEM, S-I-E-M. <laughs> uh, he warned me about that. They might have integrations into other systems, custom built systems, and ITSM, Slack for incident response. So we have integrations out of the box that allow you to integrate into the broader ecosystem. That's, that's one. Then actually taking preventative action through some of the very same integrations that we have into AWS, Apogee, the gateways, the load balancers, we are able to block subsequent transactions from a user. Um, there's a whole, disc yeah. But again, you, you're not, you're integrating with a tool that yes. would, because exactly. you're off to the side. We're orchestrating the, the, the solutions to block the transaction. Yeah. yeah. How do you identify the application, the, you know, by target IP? I mean, how, how do you label, like, which app is which, and what's the identity of the app that you find? So we're not blocking the app, we're blocking the attacker. And here, I'll go. In terms of Swagger API, so you consume a bunch of APIs, right? Mm -hmm. um, do, you, do I have to organize, catalog my applications and tell you where they're running? Do you auto-identify and say, ah, this one I've seen, this application, that this particular API, and it's over here. And what if I have 10 identical APIs that maybe with just one parameter change? How do you know which one is which one? 
especially if some of those are optional parameters. So there's a lot of work we can do. There is the ability to, to group here. I, I, I hadn't expanded this, but here on the left-hand side of the platform, you'll see there's the ability to group. Right, right. So, right? Yeah. so you can do that by any of the metadata within the platform. Mm -hmm. You could even create regular expressions. And usually within APIs, there's a big hint on what the responsibility of that API is. It's usually in the path name. So this is my books API. I see path, I see API, I see the parameters. I don't see a concept of an application. So this is where our grouping mechanism comes in, is we can either automatically generate the groups based on what we're identifying, right. or the user, the operator of the platform can create their own groups. For example, I just want to see my APIs with PCI data, and I could filter down to just those. Right? That's, that's the notional way, or you can do it on an application domain or business domain. Depending on how the business or the operations looks at their security posture, they may bifurcate this inventory in a different way. I see. And I just want to congratulate you. You're the first vendor or product I've ever seen that understands that things can have multiple classifications, meaning it can be both PII and sensitive or both GDPR and whatever. So congratulations Thank on you. having a great data model underneath your product. Thank you. <laughs> Did they get the blue-haired science bar? They will. They will. The blue-haired science bar. The blue-haired Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Awesome.